I'm Drew Stevenson. This is a video for my professional responsibility class. And here I'm going to be talking about a new ABA formal ethics opinion. Here I'm going to talk about ABA formal ethics opinion number 494, which came out in 2020 and addresses lawyers, especially advocates, who have a some sort of personal relationship with opposing counsel in the case. So diving in here, you may remember that Model Rule 1.7A2 prohibits a lawyer from representing a client without informed consent if there's a significant risk that the representation of the client will be materially limited by a personal interest of the lawyer. And so that's the rule that, uh, in terms of the model rules, that this ethics opinion sort of fleshes out. And if you're watching this video, I hope you do so in connection with the material limitations and personal conflicts of interest that we talk about near the end of our discussion um, of 1.7. And the issue here is, can it create some sort of bias or influence on the lawyer if opposing counsel is a friend or maybe more than a friend? So, Moving on then, friendships are a material limitation. A personal conflict of interest may arise out of a lawyer's relationship with opposing counsel. Some relationships require only disclosure to the client, but closer relationships require informed consent from the client in writing. Now, this is something that was a bit of a surprise from this ABA ethics opinion because the rule itself doesn't create this sort of uh, a trichotomy of cases where you instances where you don't have to disclose to a client that you might have some personal interest uh, it really that could be a material limitation and uh, cases where you have to disclose it but they don't have to consent and then cases where you have to get their consent and of course there's always the other case where the um, material limitation is somehow so severe that it was not reasonable for you to think that you could provide representation at, at all in the matter. Now, but that's what this ethics opinion does. So let's keep going here. For applying Rule 1.7A2, basically, this ethics opinion says that under 1.7A2, there are three categories of personal relationships. Uh, besides family relationships, like blood relatives, that's addressed in the comments to the rule. But there's three categories of basically friendships or personal relationships that may affect a lawyer's representation of a client. Those could be intimate or romantic relationships, friendships, or what they call acquaintances. So when they say intimate relationships, they mean an ongoing relationship, like you are living together with a partner, uh, cohabiting, they call it, um, you are engaged to be married, or you have some sort of exclusive, intimate, or romantic relationship. Uh, note that it doesn't really talk about uh, a casual dating or somebody that maybe even you've had an encounter or one night stand with, um, but these are committed, exclusive relationships, and these must be disclosed to the client. In other words, if you are in a relation, if opposing counsel is your fiance or your live-in partner, you have to disclose that to the client. On the other hand, you probably wouldn't if it's just a somebody that you dated um, once or twice up a while back. Lawyers in intimate relationships, especially if it's an exclusive intimate relationship, should probably not represent opposing clients in a matter at all, but if they do, each affected client has to give informed consent confirmed in writing. Now, what about close friends? Well, what if you're close friends with opposing counsel? Well, close friendships with opposing counsel should be disclosed to clients so that they can ask some questions or if they're uncomfortable, can seek alternative representation. In cases where it's very close, you may need to obtain some the client's informed consent. So if this is your best, best, best friend in the whole world, a lifelong friend, uh, then it, it could be sort of the same risk of influence as a romantic partner almost, even though it's not a romantic relationship. 
And then we have mere acquaintances. So the ABA says, by contrast, some friendships and most relationships that fall into the category of of acquaintances need not be disclosed, nor must clients' informed consent be obtained. In other words, there's people that you might say, oh, yes, we're friends because you know them and you um, remember them from law school or you've met them at a number of events and you get along well and you've socialized a few times and Maybe they're, you would describe them as friends more than acquaintances. And then there's just acquaintances, people that you've met, you would recognize them and know they could greet them by name if you saw them again. Now, the lawyer's role in the case actually matters. So a lawyer who is the sole or lead counsel in a matter is more likely to have a disqualifying conflict than a lawyer who has a subordinate or tangential role such as researching discrete issues or drafting sections of papers to be filed, where there's little or no direct decision-making authority in the matter, minimal contact with opposing counsel, and so forth. So we're more concerned about this. And of course, there's not a bright line here, but someone, if you're a new associate at a firm and they've merely asked you to write a research memo about um, forum and venue selection related to a case, and you have no other real involvement with the case or contact with the client, that's very different than lead counsel. And so we're not as worried about that person who's just at this stage in their career is writing a a, a legal memo for the file. We're not as worried about that as the person who actually has client interaction and makes decisions in the case. There are then some examples where the ABA says, here's some friendships that are close enough that they actually require not only disclosure to the client, but consent from the client. Um, So let's say you exchange gifts regularly at the holidays and on special occasions. So if, and I'm not talking about somebody that one time you uh, got them a gift or something like that, but Every year you have to think about what am I going to get that person for the holiday or for their birthday or something like that. And they, um, and you know that they're going to do the same for you. Um, people that you regularly socialize with, right? So they're your kind of go-to person to go out for dinner or um, go for drinks or go to an event with. You regularly communicate and coordinate activities maybe because you're, let's say your children are close friends and routinely, you, they routinely spend time at each other's homes continues with a few other examples. Is this a friend with whom your your families vacation together? Well, that's pretty close. I have lots of friends, but there's nobody I would go on vacation with my family and their family. That's a very close friendship. Or maybe somebody with whom you have a mentor-protege relationship that developed while you were working together at some point. So you've sort of been a mentor on and off or at, at different points in their career. Or somebody that, when you talk to them, you both open up and can share your confidences and intimate details of your lives and your deep, dark secrets and so forth. But let's talk about friendships that require disclosure, but you don't have to ask the client consent. You don't have to get anything in writing. And they give one kind of uh, extended example. Let's say lawyers who practiced law together and maybe meet up once in a while for a meal um, as their busy schedules permit, or if they live in different cities, try to meet when one is in the other's hometown. So you have a friend from law school you you see once in a while, uh, two or three times a year, or somebody from your first job or former job. And so you uh, maybe you keep in touch, but you're not at each other's homes all the time. They give some other issues where consent is not required, and they're not even sure disclosure is required in all these cases. Uh, Think about everybody from your first year section in law school, even though you may greet them and want to catch up a little bit when you run into them, um, they're not necessarily people that could influence your decisions in a case uh, just because they're opposing counsel. Um, The same is true for previous coworkers, maybe who a few times a year, uh, send a, a call you or send an email, but you don't regularly see each other. So typically these do not require the consent of the affected clients. And frankly, you could probably get away without even mentioning it. Now, that said, we don't have a lot of bright lines here. So whether consent or disclosure is required depends on the lawyer's considered judgment as to whether 1.7A2 
applies. In other words, is there a material limitation conflict? Is this something that could actually at least subconsciously affect your decision making in the case? And if the client was represented by some another lawyer who didn't um, have that type of history with opposing counsel, maybe they would get better advice or better representation. That's the question. And then if Rule 1.7a2 does apply, the lawyer must also reasonably believe that it's realistic to carry out the representation competently and diligently despite the conflict. So first you have to ask, is there a material limitation here at all? And then the question is, is it so severe that this is really going to um, affect things? Like there are certain options like refusing to settle and insisting on going to trial that I will not suggest to this client because I don't want to offend or, or cause a breach in the relationship with opposing counsel. If that's true, then um, you really can't provide competent and diligent representation. It's not reasonable for you to think that. Now, most relationships that fall into the category of acquaintances, mere acquaintances, and even some casual friendships, people you would describe as friends, uh, but you really only have contact with them uh, periodically or occasionally, uh, those don't even have to be disclosed, uh, nor is the client's informed consent required. So opposing counsel is someone you remember from law school or you remember from firm you worked at two jobs ago or something like that, um, and they're merely an acquaintance or that somebody that you have met at bar association meetings a few times and you always greet each other and ask each other how, you, how you're doing, but you don't really... Um, aren't really involved in each other's lives, you don't have to tell the client that if you don't want. On the other hand, you could play it safe and just always tell the client if you know opposing counsel. So that's always permissible, even when it's not required. So regardless of whether disclosure is mandated, however, the lawyer may choose to disclose the nature of their relationship or how close they are to opposing counsel just to maintain uh, good client relations to avoid misunderstandings later on, especially if your client is a little um, nervous or paranoid uh, and um, really wants to be kept abreast of such things. That concludes our discussion of this recent ABA ethics opinion. I'm Drew Stevenson from South Texas College of Law in Houston.